this film takes a stance on power dynamics. And so it could have easily have been set in a factory uh, anywhere else. I was wondering if it, if you found your, the, the kernel of your story idea through the guise or through the, the POV of this, the gangster world or with your co-writer, uh, if it was, um, uh, that literal sense that, that you wanted to explore ideas of, of, uh, um, the power dynamics or femininity through masculinity. I was wondering wh which came first or, or perhaps they're both, uh, common law partners in, in your, uh, in your screenplay. Um, I suppose I, I got a story that was about a girl in this world. So that was the starting point, but all, everything I do is about power dynamics. Mm -hmm. That's what I would focus on mm -hmm. in this world automatically or in any setting. Mm -hmm. And in, in the gangster world, it's perhaps, I won't say the most testosterone fueled thing, but where is your, fa where was the fascination specifically with, with, uh, with this, uh, world? And, and perhaps also why did you, um, go to a, a zone perhaps where there's not less risk involved, but where it's maybe more festive? Like why was that setting within the mafioso idea? Um, convenient for you? Is it vistas? Is it is it actual uh, story ideas? Um, I think I think because um, I saw a perspective that fascinated me, and normally that environment would bore me to hell because mm. I think it's easy, it's simple. You know, yeah, you've got to do your deals and you've got to you know, run from the cops, whatever. I don't really enjoy gangster films. Mm -hmm. Uh, except, of, of course, there's some that have been made masterfully, and so you like them anyways. Yeah. But the, the environment did not fascinate me, the whole men pecking order thing, until I got this book where um, where you got the, the other perspective, because, I mean, 50% of the people in this world are women, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like in any world. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, they all have girlfriends or sisters or mothers, mm -hmm. and they're all involved. They're really involved, you know. Yeah. And I found it weird that this was like still a new perspective in, in modern cinema. So, but I really wanted to explore it. One of my favorite sequences is um, when you're when the protagonist is um, she's looking at herself in a mirror in the in the club scene specifically. Um, there's not too much to derive from it in a, narr a traditional narrative sense, but I think there's a, she's sort of like, and of course there's the, the follow-up scenes prior to that, that um, where she sort of sees her place where she could end up in 20 years from now and where she's at now. Um, I was wondering if that, that long take, uh, what, what were some of the motivations behind, behind, of that specific scene? Mm. There are three images in the film where she looks herself in the mirror. And, and, and I guess to me that's a very... Um, how to explain it? It's, it's, it's a very basic thing for me to try and find out who you are by trying to meet your own gaze in the mirror. Yeah try to understand who is this person and this happens in three like sort of more or less pivotal points in the movie the first is at the very beginning when mm -hmm. she's entering this world and she's trying to she's putting on this really trashy sexy bikini that she thinks might work for these people and she's looking at herself she's judging herself she's trying to play the part before knowing the part yeah exactly. yeah and the second is, is in the in the club just before she, she goes out to meet Thomas, where she has to look at herself in the eye and and ask herself who who she really is and what she really wants. Uh -huh. And the third is, is just before the dinner where where uh, her gangster boyfriend invites his rival over to uh, squash him like a bug. It's uh, it's it's really powerful. Uh, you, uh, this film is loaded with so many powerful um, sequences. Um, I'm a big fan of the long take mm -hmm. and and letting things unfold uh, naturally, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, how do how do you 
how do you go by by in the in the writing phase are you conceptually thinking out loud this is how it's gonna this is how feelings projected emotions are gonna sort of filter out um, feelings of uh, specifically the men uh, that little that little uh, the back and forths are are fantastic because of the long takes I was wondering if that's something that you you're cohesively um, embedding in in the, uh, from the get-go I'm laying I'm, 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 lay, I'm creating the possibility for it for the actors mm -hmm. uh, with the long take because I'm, 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 I'm creating a structure that to me is basically poetic it's, it's driven by the language or the the motion in the scene which is very clear to me and then the actors come in with all their little improvisations and their little uh, gifts and their interpretations and then together they create the universe within this sort of poetic yeah linear setting that I put them inside <laughs> a lot of a lot of happy accidents yes especially with uh, some of the minor characters like the Musa character he's extremely generous with uh, the things he makes up on the go yeah and the, the weird the, their play their playfulness their ping pong thing going on all the time is this something that we find like um i think th this is your feature film debut i and prior to that i did a short film i believe is oh, that I did 11 short films then. 11 oh my god so <laughs> okay you have a lot of baggage in in in, in narrative and and finding your aesthetic is this something that we find this aestheticism this tonal emotional output do we find this in your your Absolutely. okay from the very, very start I think I started out because I started with literature, so I, my first attempts that nobody is ever going to see <laughs> were very. Uh, well, actually, what actually no, I started writing these very theatrical literary dialogues, you know, where all the subtext is on the table, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 from the very first, I was told to cut all that and just have people go through, you know, the the, the journey without without talking. <clears throat> so I guess it's, it's taken me 10 years to, yeah, to figure yeah. out how to do that in a, in a good way. <laughs> um, let's talk about your lead actress. Uh, I believe her name is Carmen. Uh, Victoria Carmen. Sorry. Victoria. Um, really quickly, I looked at her IMDb credits. She most recently had a film at TIFF. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to go, I'd like to find out more about it's a very challenging role in, in a lot of respects, and also the the fact that she, um, the character is somewhat um, not expressionless, but she's very reserved in in her uh, how she flourishes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what drew her to the role specifically. What what element was enough for her to say, "I'm going to overlook perhaps some of the more disturbing elements." I don't think she'd overlook them. I think okay. she liked it because of them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, she wouldn't have wanted this part if she had to overlook something. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, no, no, I think it was very important. I mean, I can't speak for her completely, but I think it was very important for her that the, the character had all those aspects and that we portrayed all those aspects of life. Yes. And I think she would have been very bored if there weren't disturbing elements in the movie, as I, as I would be. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think she... I think she she I know she under she told me she understood Sasha from the very start. So okay. It's easy for her to understand Sasha. And Sasha is very much a mixture of, of Johanna and me and Victoria. Okay. And Victoria is a little more um, there's the Danish word kick. Um, the only word I know is hog. It's definitely not hog. <laughs> hog. Hygge. Hygge. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's a little more uh, sprightly than than I originally wrote the character. Okay. Um, actually, has a little more integrity. While well, Johanna and me are more like pleasers when it comes to romantic relationships. Okay. A little too uh, dog waving tensions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Victoria actually brought a little bit more sprightliness into it and, and, and added some elements of resistance that made it even better. Uh, for example, in the in the rape scene, where she she's actually she's actually kind of hard with him. She's not just she's like stop it, stop now. Yeah. You know, 
so shut up, you know, she says little things like this to him, which were not in the script. And that's, I think that's very good because it makes it very, uh, um, it takes it, uh, uh, it makes it very easy to see what's happening. Exactly. It's an escalation of her being in, or not being empowered, but figuring out her own, her own um, uh, strengths, I guess. Yeah. And that's, I read it exactly how you just mentioned it right now. I, I, I um, even though it's a disturbing scene, there's a, there's a lot more happening to it than the act. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking about a couple of films. Um, I was thinking of Miss Bala, which takes a character almost as a commodity and it, it goes through like, uh, goes through different hands, if you will, uh, different handlers. Um, I was also thinking about Sexy Beast just because of that, as the aesthetic. Yeah, we, we, we had that in our, in our... Lookbook, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, you mentioned it during the Q&A, but like, I, I, I thought it was such a, a fun way to demonstrate uh, an ugly world, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, perhaps you can just like uh, um, go into detail about... about yeah. Like, why why that was fun for you the, the candy bag <laughs> i i mean i mean this is partly a critique of consumerism and capitalism mm -hmm. uh, a sort of a metaphor for that and and, and and the moral choices that her she do, does are actually on on a scale of the a version of the ones that we all make um so so for me it, it i i wanted the uh, the look of the film to be like a candy shop yeah. You were at the whole film, you were inside a candy shop, and you have you know the, all, the glittering turquoise and the glittering pink, and the the deep blue and you know all those colors. Yeah, the the ice cream store is yeah. flashes out so much. The the color in the costumes. The is, whole film should feel edible. Yeah. <laughs> because, because it's about it's about it's, it's about seduction the whole way through. It's about you know getting caught in the whirlwind of more and and, and faster and easier and and. and more, you know, ecstatic. Yeah. Uh, which is the, the dangers of consumerism and capitalism and, 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 and the moral fall that comes with it. Um, there's, you make a, two breaks, there's two sequences where um, your lead character is perhaps not in control. She's, yeah. uh, there's substance involved. I don't want to give too much away here. Mm -hmm. Um, but you make a jump in the timeline and I thought that as a viewer, as an audience member, I think that's really interesting because you, you put us, you put us in a certain zone where we're questioning a lot of things where there's a discomfort found in those scenes. Um, I wonder, I'm wondering how purposeful that is. Is it something that you find in the editing or you knew that, that those shots would end at such and such a time and then we'd pick up a little bit later maybe eight hours later 12 hours later yeah. i'm a big fan of being in the moment and 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 not to use the the dramatic curve that that screenwriters usually want to have in a scene mm -hmm. um because i suppose to me that curve is is is, is almost always a little artificial yeah construed like yeah the, the, um, um, it, yep, it, it's it's too it get, it becomes too much about uh, it it becomes like psychological entertainment in a way for me like now how is gonna react and what's he gonna do and now comes the climax you know yeah I'd rather just be there in the moment so say here's a person in this state of mind what happens there okay crap, now we have a, a different set yeah setup what happens there yeah you know? and, and and the whole the motion is, is actually between the cuts. It's just, it's just how I prefer. Yeah, that's your modus apparatus. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm always looking for different types of texts, and and the two male figures happen to be Danish and Dutch. Yes. Um, and having spent some time in Scandinavia, I know that every single Nordic nation sort of has like their own rapport. It's almost like boyfriend, girlfriend experience or lover's experience, and like, some countries are really close to one another. Like, like I imagine a little bit everywhere spread out in the world. But, but when you're in Scandinavia, it's very specific. And so I was wondering if there's like if there's like a Danish Dutch thing going on there, uh, mm. tied to maybe history that has nothing to do with cinema. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I don't think there's a specific Danish Dutch thing. I think I was looking for someone who was like tall and blonde <laughs> and, 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 and like a pretty boy, you know. And and we happen to be co-producing with Holland and, and Dutch people are very tall, so it worked, you know, it worked within them, within my I could have could have been a Swede just as well. Okay. Uh, um yeah. Um, um but yeah. I guess also Dutch people are they feel a little bit privileged. Mm -hmm. They live in this cool country and they don't have really economical troubles. And you can you can quit your job and get a post if you want. <laughs> and I love all the marketing um, materials. It's actually one of the first things that attracted me to to wanting to to to, to see the film, cover the film in the first place. Um, <clears throat> and um, the marketing materials don't necessarily adhere to a specific scene um it's more of an idea of, of 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 the scene so i was wondering if you had a if you had a clear idea of like what how you would like to present the film to the world the packaging of it yeah absolutely that's actually part of my artistic approach okay uh, i i like to do a poster in my head as, as, as a part of the conception of the film yeah and i'm very inspired by haneke <clears throat> Michel Haneke, who has done some really fun campaigns, especially back in the 90s, where he was still like really art house and a little bit obscure. And uh, his his posters and marketing for Code Inconnu. Yeah. Uh, Code Unknown. And um, what's the other one? Before or after? After, right after. Uh, Code Inconnu. After that, it's. Um... The two that are very similar. Um, the one with the, uh, the camera where somebody's. Cache? Yes. Yeah, two thousand five. I think it's two thousand five. Yeah. Those two, the marketing and, and um, of those two, is very seductive. You think you're gonna see some kind of psychological thriller, uh, or at least some some kind of thriller. And, and I think Cody Cooney even had bullet holes in the in the poster. Yeah, I know the I know the the DVD cover yeah, of it. Yeah. So 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 he's doing like consciously false marketing. To get people to go and seduce them, and then you know, turn turn the tables, and it worked so well. And it, 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 I mean, it's not like people were oh, this is not what I was going to intercede, but they yeah. they, they were really caught into the web. Yeah. So I was really uh, inspired by that. I don't think I still am. I love to to package something that's actually very challenging in a, in some in with the <clears throat> bright bright colors and and and. Uh, you know, I love posters that have a narrative where you can easily put an essay out with a thousand yeah. words. It's and, so, and it's so simple. It's a beautiful girl by a pool and on a boat, and there's she's got blood on her feet. Yeah. It's so simple, but it's... And she's in front of the boat, too. Yeah. She's at the very, very tip yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So there are two images, one where she's in front of a pool and one where she's sitting yeah. on the stern of the boat, so yeah. owning the boat. Yeah. That one is actually funny because I grew up on an island, Okay. Outside <coughs> Stockholm, so I've been on boats my whole life. Okay. That's my favorite position to sit. You know, you can feel the boat rocking, and you kind of own the boat, and you're you're like part of the sea. In a way. Yeah. So that was very much me. <coughs> but but it's yeah, it's she's somehow in control there, even though she's also like yeah, beautiful she's... and. And, and, and shows a lot of skin. Are you are you headed? Yeah. So, oh, um, it's premiered here at Sundance, but is it showing at Rotterdam or Berlin or? We're going to Gothenburg now. Okay, Gothenburg. Okay, so that's the Swedish premiere. Yeah. And uh, have uh, do you have distribution in, in this this Not yet. Okay, so we're building on the momentum that's built here, and yeah. uh, hopefully yeah. it'll work out. Oh.